Howdy again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. Welcome back. And today I'm going to do a video that's just a little different than what I usually do. And I just finished filming this series on the 2x48-inch Kalamazoo-type belt sander. And that kind of took the oomph out of me. It took a whole month to make that video, or series of videos, or seven parts. I enjoyed doing it, and I did a few other videos uh, in between. But I think that you can understand that it's, uh, it's rather exhausting doing a big project like that, and it takes probably eight or ten times longer to film that than what it would take to just make it. So I had a request that uh, something I showed in that video about my little die maker squares and my, my collection of squares. I think I'll cover that, talk about them a little bit, and some of you might find that interesting. So let's get on with it. This is the scene in part three of the belt sander video where I talk about these different squares. Now I'm not going to show you all of those squares now, I'm just going to talk about the die maker squares. Alright, let's talk about squares. Even these four inch squares here make the die maker squares look tiny, don't they? So I'm not going to really talk about these, I'll just put those in there for comparison. And I have here three different brands. I have Brown and Sharp, Sterrett, and Lufkin, which is also one of my favorites. I'll talk about them one brand at a time, and I have here some older catalogs from the 30s and 40s where I can show you some of the original uh, pictures and descriptions of these little squares. Now I'm not sure where I got this particular little square right here, but it is unmarked. And as for as it's a very nice one, but it just has no trademark on it at all. And it's not in real good condition. I have no idea where I... Well, yes, I do know. All of these came from auctions or garage sales. No, none of these were purchased new. And I think they'd be quite expensive if you had to buy them new. So there's an off-brand. I suspect it was made by a big maker. Just maybe the brand was on one of the other blades. This is a Sterrett, and it's only a two and a half inch blade. There were other blades that would have been... Uh, originally outfitted with it, but not, uh, I don't have them because they get separated. These little parts get separated. And it is a die maker square because you can see here there's an extra screw. However, you need a screwdriver to operate that as opposed to the Lufkin that has a, a little knurled knob. But these little rulers are so handy when you're doing small work and model making work and uh, owned by PK long, long ago, started taking his dirt nap. It's hardened, a little bit of corrosion on it, but still a very useful and pretty tool. Let's take a look at it in the 1935 Sterrett catalog. Now the purpose, of course, of the little set screw is to offset the blade at different angles for die making. If this is backed off all the way, the blade is pushed all the way in and is uh, square or, or perpendicular. Possibly you can see that little screw. Maybe not. But it pushes against the blade. This is the 1935 copy of the Stara Tool Catalog. And a lot of times the older tool catalogs also had the name of a distributor on there. So this came from uh, Carlisle Hardware in Springfield, Massachusetts. Still in good shape. And I like these old catalogs for reference. But here you can see the number 14 square is not a die maker square. It is just a small precision square. And it also came with two extra blades. And there's a description of it. And that cost three and a quarter, which might have been close to a full day's wages. So that was not cheap, even then. And here it is, the 453 die maker square came with two blades. Notice that two of the blades, or this blade I should say, on both ends is, is ground at angles, 45 and 30 degrees. And it's called a die maker square. There's a description of it if you would want to stop and read that. It was four bucks. So I guess it was sold either way. You could buy the extra blades or not. 
if you wanted a spring for the extra 30 cents or whatever it was. Or the complete kit with both blades would be four dollars and sixty cents. Now this is an interesting picture at the bottom because this is really the same square only it's a metric. So they were selling metric back then probably to a, a European uh, a crowd at that time but it, this is interesting to see the little uh, cutaway. You know how I love my cutaways. That way I won't have to cut this apart to show you. Isn't that great? I won't have to ruin that. Which would be hard because it, it's hardened. But here it is with that skinny blade in there and they're measuring the angle of a taper, an internal taper, and you can see that other little screw with a pin that's pushing against the blade. And then you tighten the blade up against it and, and that will hold the angle. Now that angle would have to be either checked or set with a protractor. It's not self-reading. But that's a great little picture, isn't it? The LS Sterrett. And there is a picture of Leroy Sterrett, who was still living at the time of the printing of this catalog. Would he roll over in his grave if he knew that I was holding the page open with a brown and sharp ruler? It has been said that Mr. Sterrett's coffin was painted up like this. I wonder if it's true. I sincerely hope that that last comment about the red box wasn't too irreverent, but I thought it was time for a little levity. Never being satisfied with the status quo, Mr. Sterrett also came up with the improved die maker square. Now, I've never actually seen one of these, but it has just a little bit of an indicator here. It reminds me of one of the earlier types of indicators that they used to use that were lever type rather than dial type. Alright, here's the Brown and Sharp 554. It even has the patent number on if you feel like looking that up. I do not have the regular blade for that. I only have this little narrow blade. But it is graduated. Boy, that'd be a job to graduate something that small and to print that little patent number on there, wouldn't it? But this is not a one that can be set at an angle. And it has this cute little notch here. I'm not sure of the purpose of it. Let's take a look at this in the catalog. This is the 1941 Brown and Sharp catalog just before Pearl Harbor. And you can see this also was available just as a stripped down square for $3.60 or with the extra blades for $4.20. And that square was sent complete unless otherwise ordered. And here it's shown being used in a description of, of the tool. So pause your video if you'd like to read that. Here's the Brown and Sharp 555, and I always loved that logo with the square, didn't you? And this is a 4-inch blade. A little bit tarnished. And you didn't see these older tools yet in the satin chrome. I don't know what year they developed that process. That was an expensive tool at 550. Pause the video if you desire to read that. And here's the Brown and Sharp 552 with also the little lever type of dial. And you know, I believe there's a lot of industrial espionage going on back then because they pretty much matched products and prices, didn't they? Now I'll tell you why things are so mixed up at an auction. What they will do is they generally don't sell a toolbox complete although I did show one recently. So they have a boy dump all of this out so this whole um, drawer here would go into uh, one of those cardboard trays and they would sell that. Then they would dump this out and that would be done days or weeks before the auction. Then at auction time there's still people that are 
picking it up out of one and laying it into another tray either by accident but some people I have observed this selfish people and dishonest people are making up their own little kit so let's say they want this this and this so they they will sneak that out and put it into another tray however somebody else will come back and put it back and you know just a lot of craziness going on well why did I tell you that because this one some way or another survived all the espionage and other nonsense and it's still in the original box there are number 138 CX this is Lufkin and their boxes were pretty plain Jane not like the brown and sharp so this one is pretty complete matter of fact not only complete but there are extra blades in here why there are two blades and they're both marked Lufkin and do not underestimate the quality of Lufkin. They are wonderful tools. They stopped making the precision ones in about 1970 and just went with the cheap tape rulers and folding rulers which saddens me greatly. Also we got a mix up here. This appears to be the original blade that belongs with the Lufkin. This one at an angle is it doesn't show up in the brown and sharp or steric catalog I don't know what this belongs to I never have used these blades anyway so it's no big deal to me and that one is not marked and it is not graduated but this is the one I use most often a 138 with a two and a half inch blade and the large knob here loosens the blade so you can set it just like any combination square and then the little one pushes that pin in, and I showed you a picture of that so watch this blade tilt this has to be loose in order to do that I believe you're able to see it move and then it can be locked but again you would have to set that with a protractor or a gauge and you can see now how far off of square that is I don't know it goes to two or three degrees now I'm not a die maker never was but I use these in pattern making and I am able to set my pattern draft that's probably a little too steep I usually like two or three degrees This is a 90 degree square and I now have the Lufkin set for 3 degrees. How did I set that? I used a uh, angle gauge of 3 degrees. I believe that's a more accurate way to set it than a protractor. As long as you know this gauge is accurate they could be set with a sign bar too although I think that would be kind of awkward but it would be very very accurate. Here's the Lufkin Precision Tool Catalog, probably from the 40s. It's catalog number 7. It's not actually dated inside. And I like their artwork. So that's a double steel square, not the one I just showed you. And this also is about $3. But you know, so this must be the same era, this catalog the same era as the other ones, although they maintained the same price for many, many years. They used to always print the prices in the catalog because they really didn't change. Inflation hadn't set in yet. And here it is, the die maker square Lufkin 138, shown with the extra blades and also a nice little cutaway of it. very similar to the way the other companies made it. You can see the way that lock worked right there. It is a notched screw that would hold it tight at different angles. And if you want to you can pause your video and read this. And mine is 138 CX. If you look down here that was the complete kit 
with the blades for $5.80. Now that is a little more expensive, so this must be a later catalog, maybe very late 40s or early 50s. Well, that concludes my little lecture on the die maker squares and the small tool maker squares. Hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you in my next video.